The consumer goals include fitness and health, but the elite athlete demands more. Michael Yang, from uh, Managing Director of Comcast Ventures, leads a panel of innovators that are creating solutions for our next generation of athletes. some amazing information to us in a way that is completely different. We had to develop the most advanced performance eyewear out there. So design was a key for us to consider. So lenses, materials, aerodynamics, fit, design, contemporary, good, simple looking, it had to be considered at the top of the list. And in addition to that, we had to make sure that the technologies that were going to be merged into the eyewear would make sense for the athlete. Micro display technology, the speaker and audio, the way that the battery and the electronics will merge into the frame will all have to match the specifications of the athlete. All right, how about that sizzle reel to get everyone fired up before lunch? Um, we've got four esteemed panelists today. Uh, I'm Michael Yang with Comcast Ventures, and uh, I've been coming uh, and had the, uh, the fortune of uh, moderating a bunch of panels over the years here at uh, Fitness Tech Summit. And today, we're going to talk about uh, the upper echelons of um, performance and, and athletes that are competing at that realm and kind of uh, some of the technologies that they have at their disposal today and how uh, data and other interesting uh, tech trends play into that. But I'm gonna start off and have each of my esteemed panelists uh, do a little introduction on themselves, uh, what their role is with their respective company, and then more importantly, talk to us about the product or the solution that we just saw videos of uh, that you guys are bringing to market. Davis? Yeah, so my name's Davis Woolley. I'm the president of Swim.com. Um, I swam with the National Training Center in Canada for a few years, um, and I'm taking that knowledge that I have and applying it to uh, Swim.com, where we have a platform for fitness swimmers to improve and uh, see their progress over time, get feedback from all the latest wearables that are swimming compatible, like the Apple Watch, Garmin devices, all of that great stuff. Uh, hello, my name is Carlos Marco. I'm the CEO of QuietFit. Uh, we do a wearable device uh, that basically adapts training plans to each individual user using sensor technology. We have a marketplace. We allow coaches to create training plans using intervals and different parameters. And then each user can download those training plans and then have it adapted to their own bodies, like having a, a wearable personal coach. That's Ernesto Martinez, I'm the founder and program head of Solos Smart Glasses, a business unit of Copen Corporation based out of Boston, Massachusetts, or that Boston metro area. Uh, we've been working on this project for about two and a half years. It started as an, an elite effort, uh, working with the US national team, and has evolved into what it is today, uh, a product and a tool for cyclists and runners 
uh, and expanding into the, the, the commercial electronics uh, consumer sector. Sure. And my name is Terho Lahtinen. I work for the Finnish company Suunto, which is uh, 82 years old in sports technology, started with compasses, dive computers, and, uh, and sports watches. And uh, now we have a new project uh, called MoveSense, which is uh, a programmable motion sensor that we are offering to other companies to, to use in their, their product range and, uh, and build their own applications that run in, in that sensor. And you are wearing it right now, correct? I'm wearing uh, one on my wrist and one, one here on my of yours. And uh, <clears throat> sure, the light's a little bit shiny, so you know, might as well wear it. <laughs> <laughs> These are the, the pair of glasses with the, the heads-up display augmented reality technology built in into them. Great. So first question, to just bring it real for our audience, can you give an example of a athlete you know, that has used your product and talk to us about uh, in what context did they choose to um, you know, become a user of it, and then what did they see as a result of, of using it? Who would like to start? Go ahead. So one, one of the founders of our company is a, a five-time world champion, Olympic gold medalist. Um, it's also from Atlanta, uh, Dwight Phillips. Um, I mean, for us, the whole idea to, to create the product was about helping people increase the performance and, and, and basically take your training to the next level. So these guys do this. Uh, what they do is they can create their own training plans, they can measure the data, and they can make sure they do the exercises at the correct intensity. So at the moment, we have uh, 250 coaches using our device. Uh, we have over 10 Olympic athletes in the team. And then these Olympic athletes are actually uh, passing it to other people, mainly in the track and field is what we focus on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the opportunity to have the device used by uh, top guys is, is huge. I mean, these guys need to have an edge, needs to make sure that they're doing everything uh, at the maximum performance, and then having a device that helps them achieve that is, is, is good. And, and Dwight is a track and field athlete? What, what Correct. Is, what's his event? Uh, he was doing uh, long jump. Long jump. Yeah. OK. Next. So uh, the, the Moosen Center is actually a, a pretty new uh, platform, uh, a B2B uh, solution for, for other companies. There are at the moment about 400 uh, plus developers around the world who are experimenting with our developer kit. And uh, four companies are, are showing their new <coughs> upcoming products uh, at our booth. And uh, an example there is, is one um, company that, uh, called All in One, and they are building a, a rehab uh, application. Uh, the first one that they are showing there is, is to, to monitor uh, uh, a concussion uh, recovery and uh, through uh, uh, measuring uh, a person's balance. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll talk a little bit about the history of, of, of Solos. Uh, we started this effort internally within Copen Corporation as an exploratory project to understand uh, different, different vertical segments in which the heads-up technology could be implemented, especially when this uh, new notion of augmented reality and virtual reality was coming into uh, to become like in vogue, right? Like they were still exploring a lot of these this, this ideas. And Copen being in the business of developing the core technologies for over 35 years uh, had a little bit of an edge on understanding uh, what the challenges and limitations and the opportunities that, that could be exploited in the consumer space. Uh, coincidentally, while we were exploring these different uh, markets, we, we had the chance to establish a relationship with the USA Cycling Association uh, in combination with the US Olympic uh, Committee. Specifically, uh, we were part of a larger uh, program called Project 2016 uh, which goal was to outfit the track uh, national team with the state-of-the-art uh, set of technologies that would allow them to podium at Rio. Uh, as you know, in the U.S., uh, a lot of these programs uh, have to find their own technologies are not, not federally funded. So uh, a lot of the efforts into outfitting uh, these athletes have to come from uh, individual companies and individual efforts. And it was precisely in, in that process that uh, we discovered that our technologies and our uh, product or prototype at the time had the opportunity to succeed in the marketplace and making it available to a larger consumer base and expanding beyond uh, cycling. And to your question, Michael, the, the team that we specifically uh, talked to uh, and worked with was the track national team. 
And this was for us a little bit more of a, a lab environment, if you will, in which a lot of the hypotheses and tests could be controlled and developed uh, along the other partners uh, like IBM, uh, especially working on this cognitive analytics, backend, cloud computing, and being used all of, all of that knowledge to deploy it into a mobile platform and specifically a wearable platform for the, the athletes. And today we're now launching our, our new generation that is aimed at a broader uh, consumer base. Yeah, so swim.com is more of a fitness-based platform. So the, we do have a number of former uh, Olympic medalists and athletes using <laughs> our platform, none of whom I'll mention by name. But for them um, and the ones I've talked to individually, specifically as their needs as elite athletes transitioned into their needs in, uh, as general lifestyle athletes, you know, people trying to stay in shape, some of those things that they had as elite athletes, some of that data that was being tracked for them um, and managed for them, they were looking for an easy way to track that without having to do it all manually themselves. So some of those metrics that they were used to having um, just at their fingertips you know, are no longer available, so they came to swim.com looking for those, those metrics um, you know, by just wearing a wearable. Okay, so let, let, let's be even more specific. As I've, we've talked about swimming, long jump, cycling, rehab. What, what are these metrics? What data are you guys actually collecting in each of your respective disciplines? So with swimming, what, what could an uh, Olympics swimmer not get anymore because they're not doing that and now they're just more recreational? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for things, uh, for, for an Olympic level athlete swimming, um, you know, you're going to have a coach uh, who's very attentive to you, standing over you, making sure you're staying on pace, making sure, you know, if you have a lap time that was significantly underneath or over what it should have been, um, that you're going to get back on track. And so what Swim.com allows that user to do is wear the wearable and analyze that, and Swim.com will then tell them if they're off track. Um, same thing with just general breakdowns of training volume, um, of uh, things like you know their average pace in certain in certain sets, um, the amount of a certain stroke they're swimming. Um, there's a whole lot of different things. Efficiency in their in their stroke, so how efficient uh, they are when they're swimming breaststroke or freestyle. So there's a lot of different things there that that I think elite athletes just take for granted and and are basically granted to them because they have all of those resources. So those are things that they can kind of transition over to and. And those are just basics to them. Um, those are the very basics for, for basically staying, staying fit and staying in shape and keeping on top of their swimming. Makes sense. Carlos, how about for some of the track events? Uh, I mean, in terms of the swimming for us first, uh, we measure like a stroke rate, a laps, distance, pace, and all those things. I mean, one of the key things that we measure is heart rate under the water. There is, yeah. mm. There's other devices that can measure your heart rate under the water. The problem is connectivity doesn't work because we have the heart rate inside the ear. It means that you have an instant feedback uh, of your heart rate. That means that you can create a pace alert within the settings and then make sure you're doing the, the laps at the correct intensity all the time. If you go above or below, the device is going to tell you. You can also upload the training plans to make sure that you're doing all the sets uh, as the coach is telling you. So I think that's a, that's a great advantage for the, for the track and field is mainly what we, what we measure is pace, uh, pace, pace. speed, uh, distance, and then again with the heart rate. So we work with uh, um, heart rate zones. You calibrate your device using your heart rate uh, resting calibration, then calculate your zones, and then all the training plans is deployed according to the different zones for the, each individual user. Okay. How about when you're wearing the glasses? Uh, so we're lucky to be working in a sport that uh, traditionally has been very data driven, right? Uh, and the sensors available to even the consumer market uh, that track all of this information like power, distance, calories are available. Uh, so that was kind of our, our core technology. Uh, our approach was actually uh, providing the instant feedback that athletes require in the moment as they're doing the exercise and how to aggregate all of this data in a way that it will make sense to create actionable insights so that they can tweak or modify, especially at that elite level, uh, what they're doing such that they can reach that level of performance that they need to match those gold medalists. But in terms of sensor information, it's available to your average consumer. I mean, there were a few things uh, that we were adding uh, on top of it, which including things like lactic acid threshold or 
or uh, energetic cost on, on muscle activation, which uh, for your average consumer might be overkill. But we're seeing now the days that even early adopters in, uh, are you know, getting all of this stuff and getting familiarized themselves with using all of these technologies, but still early stage. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the, the sensor uh, has a number of uh, inbuilt technologies. It has a gyroscope, acceleration, um, and uh, magne magnetic uh, field sensor, uh, temperature, heart rate, even ECG. And all that is accessible via an open API. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are trying to make uh, the, the motion sensor as easy as possible for developers and other companies to start uh, working on their own ideas. So currently there are, for instance, three companies that are working on swim-related uh, things that would, would produce basically the data that Davis just mentioned, or for, for, for track and field, uh, for, for, for any, basically all 8,000 sports in the world could be measured with the sensor. Uh, but because that's too much for one company, we are opening it uh, and offering it to, to other, other companies and developers to uh, to start measuring like performance technique uh, in, in speed uh, training, strength training, uh, like technique training, and all kinds of uh, things that you can imagine that can be measured with motion in sports. So uh, the, the, it's basically endless opportunities, and we are going to use it for some uh, concepts and, and products uh, in our own range, uh, but at the same time, uh, a number of companies are, are yep. working on their own. So, so how did the elite athlete find you or vice versa, right? You guys are all working with interesting uh, folks. Um, was that the original inspiration of the company to go pitch your technology and get adoption by uh, some of these associations, some of these uh, prominent people, or did they kind of scour the web and eventually uh, find their way to, to you? Yeah, so for us, we're really not focused at the elite athlete. There's actually a lot that is targeted at the elite athlete. And what we're trying to do is bridge that gap between um, nothing and um, all of this data. Uh, I mean, even age group swimmers um, in the United States, some of them are swimming 10 times a week. Um, they have an immense amount of data from their coach, an immense amount of attention, and a lot of money is put in um, by their parents uh, into their sport. Um, and swimming is such a technique-based um, such a technique-based sport. Uh, technique is extremely important in swimming. So to have these people who are the 25 million fitness swimmers who are out there swimming twice or more a week, who have just kind of no idea um, what they should be doing other than get in the pool, swim as far as I can, to a level where they've got some sort of information um, is really key. And uh, swim.com is aiming to do that. So what we're trying to do is, is take the information that's available to those higher end athletes, um, make it available to the fitness athletes, and then give them insights around that. Um, you know, we found it's not really helpful to just tell someone a number and expect them to have some kind of result out of it. We need, also need the component of having that kind of coaching, which, which some of these guys have talked about, where you're saying, here's the number, uh, here's where you wanna get, and here's what you need to do to get there. Um, so we're really trying to bring what has been brought to elite athletes and simplify it down and bring it um, in, a, in a format that's helpful to those fitness level athletes in the middle. Uh, from our experience, it's been all word of mouth. I mean, like uh, most athletes and coaches, they don't really know all the technology that is out there. So they, you present it to one, they like it, they start using it, and then the, the athletic world is very small. Mm -hmm. These guys, they travel together all year round, they know each other, so as soon as a product is implemented, if it works for one guy, then suddenly like, more people start using it. Uh, in our case, uh, we were fortunate to, to connect with uh, Munir Suk, who will actually be one of the panels uh, coming up next. Uh, he's uh, now the Director of Technology and Innovation at the U.S. Olympic Committee, and his role there is to scout for technologies that could be used and implemented with that level of, of athletes, and in his search, uh, as we were like also engaging to just to understand the market in general, uh, we were able to connect and demonstrate the capabilities that uh, our solution could bring to the table. And you're more focused on developers, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, basically two, two ways. So, so our, our watches, we, we ad address at least uh, directly, okay. but with, uh, with the sensors, it's mainly through, through partners. But uh, in general, uh, we pretty much share the vision uh, of swim.com, so we we want to 
to make the, the elite level, the prof professional level uh, sports data and analytics uh, available to, to like committed sports participants on amateur level uh, and make it affordable and accessible with uh, like easy enough and, and low cost enough uh, hardware. So let's talk about coaching since a few of you guys have mentioned that. Um, the, the coaching plans and some of the recommendation and guidance um, are, are, how do the athletes actually know and you know which one to, to pick and select, right? Um, how do they verify that that is uh, optimal for them? And then how much uh, switching is there from kind of one type of plan to another? Is there progression or life cycle uh, along those lines? Yeah, so for swim.com, um, we've recently gotten into this space. And I think uh, for swimming, there are thousands upon thousands of free workouts out there. And that's exactly the problem. And so that's the problem that we're trying to solve. And we don't, we don't get the athlete to pick their plan. We prescribe them a plan. Um, we ask them where they're trying to get. And we basically use the data that they've um, logged from swimming with their wearable to inform um, the plan that they should be using to get to their end goal. And through that data, we can infer a lot of things about what kind of swimmer they are. And um, it's actually fairly easy to identify what they need to do to improve in certain ways. So for example, if someone wants to improve their, their uh, total distance that they can swim or the amount, the, the total distance that they're swimming on a week over week basis, we can prescribe um, algorithmically plans that will increase their distance over time um, just by giving them certain sets. Um, and those kinds of things are things that, you know, as an elite athlete, you would know exactly, or your coach would know, hey, I need to get, get my athlete to do this to improve this facet of their training. Whereas these fitness level athletes, they generally have no clue. Their, you know, their limit is like, I'm gonna go out there, swim as far as I can, stop, rest for a bit, swim as far as I can again. And, and especially with triathletes, um, coming into swimming, even from other sports, um, you know, for cyclists coming into swimming, like interval training is brand new. So in swim.com, we're to a large extent even just teaching interval training and getting them to, to use some of those techniques that maybe age group swimmers even or, or uh, high level athletes would have learned growing up. Um, so we can kind of use the data that they give us to inform exactly what they need to be doing. So uh, it, it is different, the kind of training for an elite athlete. So for us, we very quickly realized that we couldn't put all the training plans available for everybody. The, the professional athletes, they wanted to have the training plans on a private mode, so we create like a, a separate accounts for those. Mm -hmm. They can create their own training plans and they can share it between two, three athletes, one athlete, um, have it in a private mode, and then we have the open platform which allows coaches to create the plans and then sell it to the public, the general public. General public can go and do a search, they can download the first day for free, they can see if they like the guy, and then they can download the full training plan. When that full training plan is completed, then they can go and select the next one and keep increasing, getting faster, losing weight, or whatever they want to achieve. Well, I would say that uh, for us it's uh, a little bit uh, different in the sense that they are already established uh, training platforms that have been vetted and validated uh, at the level that, that we're talking about. Uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of efforts into bringing analytics and cognitive understanding of what hap what's happening to, to the data, uh, but I think that brings us to yet another problem, which is this multi-platform development that for a multi-sport environment, it creates a, a chaotic mm -hmm. uh, uh, decision-making process, right, into how can I synchronize the data that uh, as a swimmer I will get and then as a writer I will get. Uh, and this is something that we, we, we take a look at, but we were not necessarily addressing in the context of our engagement with the, uh, the cycling team. Uh, in, in that case, what, what we were trying to, to achieve is precisely minimize the gap between the time that it would take an expert that has been working in quantitative analysis of all this information and make it in such a way that that insight could be relayed to the coach and the athlete within seconds. Uh, and that was one of the key features that when we looked at this broader problem of platform understanding, we had to like uh, attack, and, uh, case in point. Uh, Neil Henderson, who was the, uh, the, 
the analytics coach for, for the second. It would take him uh, at least a couple of days between the training session, collecting all the data from all the sensors, bring it into an Excel sheet, plotting it, run his own understanding and algorithms, bring it down, and then the next day, go talk to the coach and say, I think Chloe is not doing the exchanges right because of this second, and I think uh, Sarah needs to put a little more power on, on search mm -hmm. curve. Right now, all of that is gone, and within, as I mentioned, seconds, if not uh, in real time, the coach can see what the hap what's happening to each one of the athletes. He's able to convey and communicate all this information to the riders as they're doing it. Remember, these these, these ladies are, are are biking at 30, 40 miles an hour, right? And and they're focusing on the sport, but they, you still need to coach them and yelling in a microsecond or half a second as they're passing by. Is, is useless. Mm -hmm. So how do you enable that level of communication mm -hmm. such that the, the impact that you can have can be impacted in, 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 in real time? And of course then, once you validate how you bridge that gap, and, and our approach has been through this uh, real time augmented reality, audio feedback, and, and whatnot through the Solus platform, and, and I want to take, I want to call it platform, let's say, our solution. Uh, but then you start discussing, right? All right, well, how do you then play in an environment where the coaches are also training triathletes and they want to use the same type of techniques to offer to, to their clients, but now you have uh, sites like QuiFit or Swim or Training Peaks or Strava, and they're all using their own unique mm -hmm. uh, sort of standards, which at this point, everybody's trying to innovate in sensors and platforms but then it creates yet an additional uh, barrier to entry for, for, for the coaches. So this is what we're trying to uh, knock down next. Great. Uh, we are uh, actually enable, uh, enabling several different ways to do this. So one is that the sensors obviously generate data that, that the, the athletes or, or the coaches can use to adjust their training and assess the situation. Then the data can be also used uh, in, in like automated training plan uh, adjustments. And then uh, we also have quite a big community of, of uh, users of our watches. And there uh, we are analyzing the big data and actually producing kind of like community-powered uh, training plans. So we can, we can check if, for instance, if you run, want to run a marathon, you can go to, to our, our uh, sports community, moosense.com, and then, then tell that, that, that uh, or, or check there that how did other people train who run a four-hour marathon. And then, then you get their like weekly uh, statistics and, and how, how much, how far, uh, how, how hard they train to reach the same type of a uh, result that you are thinking of with your, your age group and, and, uh, and other background parameters. So that, that's also uh, an option. I challenge that a bit. I mean, in my opinion, it's great that the community is effort, but uh, we came to the realization that every individual requires that customized plan to that person. Right. And even though that physiologically you might be very uh, mm -hmm. similar to another athlete, the way that you should train might be 180 degrees different. Sure, but that, that of course that depends on the, on the, on the person and on, the, on his or her background and, and, sure. and starting exactly. point. So if you just want to, to complete a marathon or finish a marathon, then, then it might be a totally different approach than, than running a two and a half hour right. end result. And uh, so, but it, it, at least it gives, an, gives you an idea of uh, what do you need to do? Are you, are you able to get there at all? Or, or, right. or do, you, do you maybe need to get some uh, gives you a good like start. professional coach or, or, mm -hmm. or like, like real, uh, real uh, person who supports how to, right. how mm -hmm. to do it? Anyway, I don't want to spice it up. No, it's fine. challenging some of those notions. Yeah, but it's, it's good. <laughs> Let me switch gears. I mean, for the value that you bring to these types of athletes, how do you get compensated? So how do you guys make money doing what it is that you do? Uh, maybe walk down the line. I'm curious to hear about that. Yeah, sure. So swim.com is 100% totally and completely free. Um, you have to buy your own wearable, and that's pretty much it. Um, we have apps that run on Apple Watch, for example. Those are also free. Um, and the way that, that we're, uh, our kind of revenue model at this point is um, our parent company also owns the largest retailer somewhere in the US. 
So we're targeting, I mean, if I, I can go to USA Swimming, I can go to US Masters Swimming, and I can say, hey, um, let me advertise to all of the swimmers in your, in your, uh, in your organization. And they'll you know, give me a list, and I can pay and send out advertisements to those swimmers. Um, but if you're just someone who's out there swimming, a couple times a week, there's like no way that we can find you. Um, and swim.com is, is exactly how we do that. So you're signing up, you're using our free service, and along the way of your journey to becoming a better swimmer, you're gonna need to purchase things, new goggles, new suits, um, new wearables, um, and we're gonna know exactly when you need those things. We're gonna know when you need a new pair of goggles because we know exactly how often you swim and we know how long goggles last. Um, we're gonna know exactly which swimsuit to market to you because you're a certain age, you're a certain level of swimmer, um, you know, we know how fast you are and we know what types of suits your uh, demographic buys. And um, you know, you can't get that information from Facebook, uh, what type of suit someone's gonna be interested in buying. All you can really get is what they've looked at um, and what they've shopped for before. So um, that's really powerful in a world where you know, uh, Amazon is trying to lower the price of everything um, we're really providing more to our end customer uh, through the retail channel. We can provide, you know, rather than just saying like, here are a bunch of suits, pick one you like and buy it from us, we can let you know the week ahead that you even kn knew you needed a suit, or a month ahead, we can let you know, you know, you know your suit is gonna be wearing out soon, um, and here are some suits that we think you'll like, or you're, you're trying to improve in this certain way, here are some paddles you can use for this type of workout, or here's a kickboard, or um, here's the latest innovation in this area. And so rather than just trying to sell someone something um, because they want it, we're really trying to get ahead of that and sell someone something because they're trying to improve in a certain way. Um, and uh, this kind of model of targeting the fitness swimmer in between like the someone who's not swimming and someone who is training and competing and involved um, is really how we're doing that. A uh, very simple revenue model. We sell a hardware device and then we sell a, a membership, a recurring monthly revenue. And how much is that, the membership? Uh, we're experimenting at the moment with different packages. The, the top athletes, they're not paying anything, and then mm -hmm. we're experimenting with, the, uh, with individual users. Yeah. Got it. Uh, first of all, is the, the, the hardware piece to begin with, uh, MSRP of uh, $499. Uh, and then there's a software play that it can be direct uh, to the consumer or through different channels or partnerships, uh, especially in the digital platforms that we, th that we discussed. Uh, there are many opportunities uh, around that, unlocking premium features or accessing uh, special training materials, uh, uh, and that's the next stage. Well, we, we are also a hardware manufacturer, so that's quite, quite an obvious uh, revenue stream for us. Uh, but then we are also thinking of uh, of different uh, digital uh, assets that, that we can start licensing to, to companies who use the sensors in their own products. Great, so um, why don't I open up to the audience and see if we have any questions over here from anybody, from the panelists. Go ahead, right here in front. It seems that the panel is focused on the consumer or the prosumer. Uh, the panel is uh, uh, focused on the consumer or, uh, or prosumer. Uh, what are the endeavors to get into uh, truly the elite, uh, major league at athletes, uh, whether they're U.S. or, or non-U.S. based? What are those activities and what is the receptivity uh, at the team level? Well, I think we have some that are focused on elite athletes, but, but go ahead. You guys can... Well, uh, actually, uh, our partners who work with, with Moosens, uh, there are a number of uh, companies who, who focus really high-end uh, pro athletes as well. Uh, but I, I think at, at the moment on the market, most companies go for, uh, like after this, this uh, couple of uh, professional sports like uh, basketball and, uh, and, uh, and football, and, uh, and, uh, and they forget that there are 8,000 different sports in the world. So uh, there are actually a huge amount of athletes, both on elite level and, 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 and on a more uh, regular level, who would want and, and need uh, different kinds of uh, data and analytics and, uh, and sensors. 
and at the, at the moment they don't get uh, anything. So that's, that's the gap that we are trying to bridge. Yeah, and I can answer that question as well, um, given my background. So uh, I, the way I relate um, this is that the really, really elite athletes in the world, um, the systems that support them are more akin to what NASA is doing um, and you're not, there, there aren't a lot of companies who are trying to uh, invent and then package and then market um, a finished polished product to those pro athletes because realistically that's a tiny, tiny market. What uh, most, most, what's really happening is that there's some need at this high level. So for example, um, uh, when I, back when I was swimming, uh, an athlete named Brent Hayden, he was the world champion in the 100 freestyle, um, and he won a bronze medal at the Olympics in the 100 freestyle as well in uh, 2012. So he had a really, really slow start. And so what they did is they brought out a bunch of camera equipment, they brought out another uh, elite athlete who had a really fast start, and they just started analyzing um, what the differences were. And if you have a team of people and money, you can just do that all manually. Um, and so what then ends up happening is that they learn a lesson and they find out why he has a slow start. And they, they find out, okay, well his entry angle, it's way off. And, and this great athlete who's got a great start, his entry angle is fantastic. Um, and it's consistent and we can measure this. And then they turn that measurement into something where they can go back and every time they capture video of him, they can relate back to that measurement. And then that's something that, that eventually trickles down, that knowledge that they've gained, and someone can turn that into a product and say, and then go market it and say, you know, this insight that we've learned um, from this pro athlete can be now used for this bigger market and maybe there's a business opportunity here. But really what's happening at the very top end, there's no money to be made in that. It's almost all money to be lost, just experimenting. Um, and from my experience, you know, the coaches and the, and the staff that I had, it was very, very much a skunk works type deal. If we needed something, we'd build it. And, and if we needed someone or we'd go find them and we'd build something. It was never really a polished product. Um, there have been a couple attempts at these really polished products coming to elite athletes in swimming. Um, one of them I can think of is called Triton Wear. And they're having a really, really tough time because there's no demand, you know, if those, if those people at those high, uh, high levels realize they need something, they're already going out and getting it. Um, there's really no, there's no, they're so, all these people are so on the cutting edge that if something's happening around the world, they're hearing about it, they're figuring it out, and they're getting it before someone can package together this polished product to kind of market them and say, hey, you guys need this. It's more, we need something, someone build us something. Yeah, actually, it's a, uh quite often the other way around, that, that to get to the elite, at least you have to pay, not, not that you would uh, make some money. Yeah. Anyone else? I'll ask a question then. Um, what's a sport uh, that you think could really benefit from the better usage uh, of technology? You know, we're covering some interesting sports up here, uh, because I think most people in the audience would think about running and things like that that have been well trodden for, forever. But what's a sport out there that maybe you're aspiring to go after, but you need better wearables or sensor data or math or something like that? Uh, what's untapped? I believe all of the sports that are currently uh, evaluated without specific metrics and are very much up to the judges uh, mm -hmm. can benefit mm -hmm. from the use of technology such that there can be a more objective way of analyzing this uh, example, uh, Olympics uh, gymnastics, right? Uh, you have all of these amazing young athletes that to an untrained eye, uh, they're perfect, right? And, but to the judges, the difference between a seven and a 10 and a nine are the angle at which the toes were pointing at the end of the split. Like who would have known that? Or diving. Uh, so definitely there's an opportunity there to maximize that. And something else that, that we believe that there's an opportunity, not for uh, solos per se, but in general for the use of technology, is uh, team sports. Uh, a lot of the, what we discussed today are individuals, right? That can be where the technology, you can analyze it, you have the personal ecosystem, but then how do you expand collectively the use of technology so that it can benefit that? There's some initial work done around 
uh, things like football or uh, soccer, uh, but more around nutrition, around uh, video analysis and, and whatnot. But, but I believe those are the two key areas that uh, can definitely benefit from the use of uh, technologies available today. You talked about video, you talked about wearables and, and whatnot. And I think I'll add to that as well and I'll say that um, you know, traditionally what we have or what technology has tried to approach is, is things that we're already looking for. So you, know, you start with time, you start with stroke rate, you start with stroke count, you start with efficiency. And some of these things are things we maybe are already measuring in a very inefficient way, and we want to be able to get more data or get data more accurately. And so we already are looking for those solutions. Um, and I think the areas where uh, we can see the most benefit are probably in sports that have a heavy technical component where the technique is very important. So in, in something like rowing, um, it's really all about the training regime. Something like swimming is heavily influenced by technique. I mean, I could go you know, swim a, a, a 50 meter and, and maybe someone off the street could go swim a 50 meter and I could go as easy as possible and they could go as hard as possible and, and I'm gonna beat them every single time. And it's, and it's because of that learned technique. So for things um, that are technique based, that's not something you can measure with a direct metric um, as, uh, as Ernesto mentioned. Um, so, so those things that where technique are very important and we can start pulling it, putting a number and assigning it to that technique or putting some kind of data or score and saying, you know, this is how you can improve this component of the technique. I think that's where there's the most opportunity because to an outsider, those things are very hard to evaluate um, without having someone actually looking at you who knows what they're talking about. So if you can put a wearable on and it can tell you your, tech, your technical skill or how to improve your technical skill without having to have another person physically standing there and evaluating it because they know what looks good, I think that's a huge opportunity. Great. And that, uh, well, go ahead. We'll I'm, I'm uh, personally the mo uh, very excited about a number of companies uh, modeling strength training with the sensor. Okay. It's going to be both for like ordinary gym members who typically don't know what to do there, and uh, then very specific like strength training for swimmers or strength training for, for runners, and which is not not really available at the moment on a like training plan uh, level, other than than through uh, like expert coaches. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. We're out of time. Uh, please give me a hand and uh, thanking the panelists here. Thank you. Thank you.